So, Fiskerma, Fastemai, dear Dave, Dimadur, Dave da Prinhounda, and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Seven languages is enough? <laughs> well, it's about the Celtic languages, so I thought we should try to squeeze each one of them in there. Um, so, thank you very much to Susan and for the Society for having me. Um, so, this is an introduction, a brief overview of Celtic languages, the history, the history of Celtic studies as a discipline and so on. Um, so a bit about myself, I do live just up the road in South Windsor, although I'm originally from the Boston area. I grew up just outside of Boston. I've been in Connecticut for about 10, 11 years now. I think eight of those in South Windsor. Um, I have always been something of a I suppose you could call me a language geek. I've been fascinated with languages since I was a kid, since I was that big, as far back as I can remember. Um, I probably got my start learning to count to ten in Spanish on Sesame Street when I was <laughs> little. I just kind of snowballed from there. By the time I got to grades in school, where you could actually start learning languages, I took up French and Latin in seventh grade, and then I took up Russian in high school, because it was the most exotic thing on offer at the time. And my hobbies have always been just kind of dabbling in languages, learning about them, learning about how they work, trying to learn a few phrases, and so on. And by the time I had reached about 20 or so, I had developed an interest in Celtic languages, just because they, I thought they were really interesting languages. And it was about that time that I learned about my own family background. I was talking about it to my grandmother at one point, and uh, she said, oh yeah, I remember when, when I was little, my aunts used to speak Gaelic to each other when they didn't want the kids to understand what they were talking about. <laughs> and I just went, wait a minute. This was spoken in our family. Two generations ago. <laughs> Nobody told me. Um, so that solidified an interest for me in Scottish Gaelic in particular, although I retain a strong interest in all of the Celtic languages. Um, but that led ultimately to my going to Scotland to go to university where I um, attended the University of Aberdeen for four years and got my degree in Celtic studies. Although I ended up not pursuing an academic career, but I am nonetheless trained in that field. Um, and then I came back to the US, met my wife, got married, and as it turned out, she is a Scottish dance teacher. My wife Maggie <laughs> teaches Scottish Highland dancing and Cape Breton step dancing. She had a school already, which was basically her, called the Callender School of Scottish Dance at that time. And then when I came into the picture with the languages, we expanded to make it the Callender School of Celtic Arts. She right. taught dance, yeah. I taught language. Yes. She also had a little known, oh, it wasn't known to me at the time, a plan that, um, I'm just gonna keep an eye on the time here so I don't ramble on too much, that if she didn't marry a piper, for the dancing you see, <laughs> the highland fling and the sword dance and so on, that she was going to turn whoever she married into a piper. <laughs> So at one point, back in 2002, we'd been married for a couple of years. I went off to Scotland to visit my friends from university. I came back home and she said, guess what, dear? While you were away, I signed you up for bagpipe lessons. <laughs> I thought, OK, what the heck, I'd give it a try. And then I fell in love with it. And it's been a huge part of my life ever since. So I've added teaching beginning bagpipe lessons to the whole mix. My wife likes to say that we're professional Scottish people. <laughs> um, so I wish I could say that the calendar school was an actual institution with a building where everybody could come and learn all these things that actually in reality is the two of us and occasional friends and acquaintances and living rooms and rented church halls and things, but we still nonetheless we just love spreading knowledge of the music and the dance and the song and the instruments wherever and whenever we can. Um, and of course, my wife said, a dozen times, don't forget to bring your business cards, don't forget to bring your business cards. <laughs> and I got here and I forgot my business cards. <laughs> so if you want to know about the school, come talk to me and I'll be happy to talk to you. <laughs> um, so, what are Celtic languages? What is Celtic? Who are the Celts? There's a, a lot of stuff out there. Um, everything today gets called Celtic. You can find everything from Celtic scones to Celtic socks to Celtic CDs, you know, what, what have you. Um, so, first I'll mention something about the pronunciation. Because you may have noticed this word C-E-L-T-I-C -E is nonetheless, nonetheless usually pronounced Celtic. 
Whereas by the rules of English pronunciation, you would expect Celtic, like the basketball team in my hometown. Um, and that is in fact not wrong. That was the original pronunciation of the word in English. Um, and in other languages, they still use a soft C. French has celt, Spanish has celto, Italian has celto, and so on. It seems to be, as far as I could ascertain, a fairly recent 20th century thing that the pronunciation Celtic has in English become preferred. This may be due to the influence of the languages themselves, such as Welsh and Gaelic, where the letter C is always pronounced hard, and therefore we have Celt rather than Celt in those languages. So today, the term Celtic refers to a wide variety of different peoples, languages, cultures, religions, and so on, covering territory from the British Isles to the Iberian Peninsula to Asia Minor, over a swath of time from the Iron Age to the present day. It's a very broad term. It was not always like that. Before the 18th century, no one in the British Isles was ever called a Celt, or did they ever call themselves a Celt. The term Celt and Celtic referred specifically to people, a tribe, or perhaps groupings of tribes on the European continent who were known to the Greeks and Romans. Um, they are mentioned in classical writings. The, I have a terrible memory for dates, which is why I have my notes here in front of me. The um, Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, mentioned the Celts. He was actually talking about the Danube River, and he mentioned that the Danube has its source among the Celts. Now, the source of the Danube is actually in the Black Forest, near what today is the border between Germany and Switzerland. Um, and general scholarly opinion bears this out. The most widely held opinion is that the original homeland of the people that we know as Celts is what it today is generally around Austria, Switzerland. Two of the really famous big Celtic archaeological sites are one is in Austria called Hallstatt, one is in Switzerland called La Ten. So that bears that out, the archaeological record. Pythias, the Greek geographer in the fourth century BC, mentioned that he was talking about Britain, but he mentioned in passing that it is north of the lands of the Celts, again placing them on the continent underneath it. And famously, Julius Caesar in the Gallic War, Book 1, Chapter 1, starts right off saying, all Gaul is divided into three parts, one of which is inhabited by the Belgae, another by the Aquitani, and the third by those who in their own language are called Celts and in ours, Gauls. And this is the people to whom the term Celt and Celtic referred until the year 1707, when a Welshman, a very, very famous linguist who basically founded Celtic studies, a man named Edward Llwyd, published a book called the Archaeologia Britannica. Llwyd was ahead of his time. He was a linguist and a naturalist and a botanist and a geographer and an antiquarian, one of these amazing, incredibly smart people who worked in many disciplines. He traveled for years around the British Isles, doing rigorous fieldwork, collecting data, studying the languages. And then he compiled them all into this big volume, which founded Celtic studies. It founded comparative philology, these comparisons of languages. And in this book, he <coughs> demonstrated, proved the connections between Gaelic and Welsh, so in <coughs> Britain, and Gaulish, or what is left of it, <coughs> spoken in Gaul, the Gauls or the Celts that Caesar mentioned. And so this basically founded the discipline of Celtic studies, because at the time everything was being organized into branches and trees, animals were being classified into species and genera, and languages were being organized into families and branches. And so he needed a name for this branch of languages that he had proven were all connected. And so here in English, for the first time, the term Celtic was applied because the Gauls, the Celts, were the oldest known people at that time who spoke one of these languages. So he named the grouping, the branch of languages, after them. Now, Fluid just used the, name, the term Celtic to refer to the languages. He never called the people of the British Isles Celts, just that they spoke Celtic languages. However, this was picked up very quickly. Um, perhaps not coincidentally, 1707, the year that book was published, also saw the Treaty of Union in which the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of Scotland, the thrones were joined, forming the Kingdom of Great Britain. 
and a new nation state, a new political identity called British. Now, people, as I said, caught on to this Celticness very quickly. And so even though Huey didn't use the term to refer to the peoples of the British Isles, it wasn't long before they themselves were, other scholars, other antiquarians, especially those who were Irish and Scottish and Welsh, within a couple of decades, by the 1720s, were talking about we the Celts and referring to monuments as Celtic. Um, and so by the mid 17th century, the idea was well established. And by the 19th century, or sorry, excuse me, I meant the mid 18th century, 1700s, apologies. And by the turn of the, into the 19th century, the 1800s, the idea was essentially taken for granted. It was just widespread and accepted. For example, by the time Sir Walter Scott wrote Rob Roy in 1817, he mentions in that book, he calls the Scottish Highlanders Celts with no further explanation given or needed. People just knew at that point. And so this is really the birth of what we could call modern Celtic identity. In a sense, this is literally where the Irish and Welsh and Scots and Cornish and so on became Celts. This is when the term became applied to them as opposed to just these ancient people on the continent. Um, the assumption, the kind of things people took for given as a given, were essentially that the language equals a people. People have a language. If we speak Celtic languages, therefore we are Celts. If the ancient Celtic language is spoken on the continent, then they must have brought it here, and we are descended from them. I mean, this was just accepted. Um, I won't go into this too much. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards if anyone's interested. More recently, in the 1980s and 90s, some archaeologists have been disputing this. People who looked at it, the archaeological record as opposed to the linguistic record saying that, well, actually, the archaeological record doesn't support this idea of a mass migration from the continent to the British Isles. So perhaps the Scottish and Irish and Welsh, as far as we can tell, are descended from the people who were there before, who were descended from the people who were there before, but aren't actually descended from the ancient continental Celts. This caused an enormous amount of controversy, <laughs> because a lot of people have a vested personal and political identity in being Celtic. Um, so as I said, I won't go into that too much, but there are more recent challenges to the sort of established, I wouldn't say doctrine, but just the scholarly ideas. Um, the key thing to take away from all of that, which I hope wasn't too boring, um, is that the defining, uniting feature of all things Celtic is language. It is first and foremost a linguistic classification. What unites the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, with the Gauls, with the Galatians, with the Celtiberians going back to the Iron Age, is that they all spoke languages which are classified as Celtic. Different ethnic groups, different cultures, different languages, different religions, and so on, as I said, but they all spoke Celtic language. That is the tying feature that binds everything together. So today, people talk about Celtic art and Celtic music and so on. But ultimately, it all goes back to language. The art, the music, the cultural artifacts, the monuments were made by people who spoke Celtic languages. So on to the languages themselves. Um, I'll maybe describe this briefly, because I don't know if everyone has a background in this. Um, so the great majority of languages spoken in Europe, and many languages spoken in Western and Southern Asia, Persia into India, belong to the same language family, meaning ultimately, thousands and thousands of years ago, they stem from a common source. We call this family Indo-European. Some of you may have heard that name. This is the family. The family tree then break, is divided into multiple branches. One branch, for example, is called Germanic. This is a branch that includes German, Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, and English. Another branch is called Italic. Latin belongs to this branch and the languages which descend from it, like French and Italian and Spanish. Another branch is called Slavic, which contains Russian, Polish, Bulgarian, uh, Bulgarian languages like this. There are many branches. One of these branches is the Celtic branch that Floyd described. So, another perhaps thing to take away is that English and the Celtic languages are thus linguistic cousins. They are 
belong to the same family, although they are in different branches of the same family. However, they have also spent a lot of time together, so there are connections, ultimately, even though there's a lot of surface variation that's very different. Um, again, something I don't really have time to go into here today, but many of the things which separate English from its immediate sister languages, like Dutch and German, are found in Celtic languages. And English is also the only Germanic language which has shared territory with Celtic languages for a millennium and a half. So there's been influ influence, interference, whatever you want to call it. There's a, been a lot of back and forth. Um, so the Celtic branch is subdivided in different ways, which overlap variously. One distinction made by some scholars is what they call continental versus insular. Continental being languages like Gaulish that were spoken on the European continent, insular being languages like Welsh and Gaelic that are spoken within the British Isles. There are some distinguishing features that only appear in one place and the other. Another distinction some of you may have heard, if you're into these languages at all, is P-Celtic versus Q-Celtic. This refers to a sound change that happened in certain ones whereby an original k or k sound became p. A famous kind of canonical example of that is the word for head, which in Welsh is pen with a p, and in Gaelic is kyan with a k. Another division is goidelic versus brythonic. This applies strictly to the languages spoken in the British Isles. The goidelic languages are the Gaelic languages, spoken in Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. The Brythonic languages are Welsh and Cornish and Breton. And as I said, there is some overlap. For example, today, Goidelic and Brythonic, Q Celtic and P Celtic overlap. All the Goidelic languages or Gaelic languages are Q Celtic. All the Brythonic languages are P Celtic. However, there are also languages of both the P and Q sides found on the continent as well. So it's they overlap in, in different ways. Uh, I will First, go over a brief overview of some of the extinct Celtic languages, which is a, not a nice term, but it's a term linguists use for languages that aren't spoken anymore, or which have evolved into something completely different, the way Latin turned into Italian or French. Although in this case, they don't have any descendants. They're sadly gone. Um, first one would be Gaulish, which I mentioned. This is probably the best attested of all the ancient continental Celtic languages. It was spoken into the Roman period, known from around 800 or so different inscriptions. Things like calendars, pottery, coin inscriptions, dedications to gods, statements of ownership, this belongs to so-and-so, carved into stones. Uh, first written in the Greek <coughs> alphabet, later on in the Roman alphabet. <coughs> so this is a language that would have been spoken by the Gauls that Caesar met. Another one is Galatian, which was spoken in Asia Minor, what today is Turkey. Very little left, around 120 or so words, names, personal names, place names, that survive in other sources, glosses, or names in, for example, Latin writings, but a personal name or a place name that is obviously of Celtic origin. Um, very, very close to Gaulish. Some scholars consider it a dialect, a variant of Gaulish. Some consider it a separate language. This was the language spoken by the people to whom St. Paul wrote an epistle. His letter to the Galatians. They were a Celtic-speaking people. Another one, the oldest attested Celtic language is called Lepontic. Some of these names are wonderful. Uh, the oldest attestations go back to the 6th century BC, up till around 100 BC. It was spoken in what is now the Raetia area in southern Switzerland and northern Italy. Around 140 inscriptions survive, written in a northern Italic alphabet derived from Etruscan, if any of you have heard of Etruscan. So a sort of relative of the Latin alphabet, but <coughs> went off in a few different ways. Again, some scholars consider this an outlying kind of variant of Gaulish. Some consider it distinct enough to be considered a separate language. The next one would be Celt-Iberian, as the name might imply. It was spoken in the Iberian Peninsula, which today is Spain and Portugal. Celt-Iberian was spoken in the northern and central parts, around what today 
are the uh, provinces of Aragon, New Castile, and Old Castile in Spain. Probably the second best attested continental Celtic language, around 200 inscriptions from the 2nd century BC to the 1st century BC. They had an interesting script of their own. A few towards the end were in the Latin alphabet due to Roman influence. The next one would be one that was called variously Galician or Northwest Hispano-Celtic, for lack of a better term, but it was spoken in the northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, what today is Galicia, Asturias, northern Portugal. Uh, sparsely attested, just a few, like the um, Galatian, a few words, names, place names, personal names here and there in other Latin writings and local inscriptions. Some considered a variant of Celt-Iberian, others separate. And the last, but not least, would be Pictish, which was spoken in what is now Scotland, northern and central Scotland, above what we call the Fourth Clyde Line, which if you draw, if you look at the map of Scotland, there's a fourth is, sorry, the Firth is the English form of the word fjord, some long, narrow sea inlet. On the east coast, there's one called the Firth of Forth, where the city of Edinburgh is. On the west coast, there's one called the Firth of Clyde, which is where Glasgow is. If you draw a line between them, they call that the Fourth Clyde Line. And above that was Pictish territory. The Romans built two walls to try to keep them out. <laughs> Not that it was terribly successful. Um, again, Pictish only survives in geographical names, personal names, and other writings. We don't really, they didn't actually write anything down themselves directly that they left to us. The most widely accepted theory is that it was Brythonic, so a sister language to Welsh, for example. Um, the Venerable Bede, if any of you have read any Bede, mm -hmm. he's an Anglo-Saxon writer. He mentions that the Picts had a distinct language that was different from British, i.e. Welsh, or the ancestor of Welsh, <laughs> and Gaelic. <coughs> um, and that St. Columba, or as he's known in Gaelic, Columcilla, who um, Christianized Scotland, um, used an interpreter to talk to the Picts. The Picts, however, were Gaelicized. They merged with the Gaelic kingdom of Dalriata, which is how Gaelic came to Scotland, incidentally, I'll come back to that. By the 10th century, they had adopted Gaelic language and culture. Scholarly handling of these ancient Celtic languages is very argumentative. <laughs> due to, you may have heard, I said, okay, 200 inscriptions here. 140 inscriptions here, they're very sparsely attested, very little has come down to us. Oftentimes, what has come down are not direct inscriptions, but names, place names, personal names, things that linguistically obviously are Celtic in form. Um, but there's not very much of it, and so therefore, interpretations of what they signify can vary widely. The evidence is so scarce that it can be used to justify just about any theory, and so there's a lot of kind of attitudes in Celtic scholarship, which is part of why I ended up not pursuing a career in Celtic <laughs> academia as much as I love it, because I know people that did. I've seen people put out papers and then get blasted for them by somebody who has a completely different idea about what these six words mean. And, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but it, it's very kind of, yeah, cutthroat as well. Um, now, the living Celtic languages, I hope I don't have to cut this out too much, it's already 2.30, um, there are six surviving Celtic languages. All of them are endangered minority languages. The Brythonic languages, as I mentioned, are Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. Welsh has, these are approximate figures going by the most recent census, which was in 2011, 562,000 speakers, so just over half a million speakers making it the largest and most vibrant of all six Celtic languages. Breton was in second position, uh, around 350,000, excuse me, 350,000-ish total speakers, of whom just over 200,000 are native. Um, you know, I'll come back to this. Breton's in a particularly precarious position because the great, great majority of those 200-plus thousand are elderly, 70 and older. And within the next quarter century, the number of Breton speakers is expected to have or worse. 
Cornish is often considered to be an extinct language. Um, I'll go into the history a little in a little bit, but um, by the 18th century, it had ceased to function as a community language. The last, the person who's widely regarded, but perhaps not the, but the person who's widely regarded as the last native speaker, a woman named Dolly Pentreath, died in the late 1700s. I forget the exact date, and I neglected to write it down, but late 18th century. Um, this coincided, though, with an interest in the language by antiquarians. The revival movement started around the same time. So we can't say there was a point where the language ceased to be used, period. There was some overlap between the, the ends of the lives of the last native corner speakers and people who were interested in, not necessarily in bringing it back to life at the time, but in studying it. And you know, they were interested in the, uh, the ancient history and the culture and so on. There are no census figures for Cornish. Estimates from my friends who are speakers and scholars in Cornwall are around 3,000 total speakers, the majority of whom are people who learned it as a second language, as a, you know, a way to manifest their Cornishness, as a, a badge of non-Englishness, as some sort of the Welsh and Irish folks in the room can appreciate. Yes, yes. Um, of whom some five or 600 are regarded as native speakers in the sense that children who were brought up bilingually speaking both Cornish and English. So not a direct line from the speakers of the 18th century, but nonetheless children that were raised using a revived version of the language that they're using now. On the Goidelic side, Irish is in an interesting position. If you believe the census, you've got up to 1.7 or 1.8 million Irish speakers. This involves self-reporting. You know, it says, do you speak, read, or write Irish? And I said, yes. Um, a lot of these people, in all honesty, are people who have studied Irish in school or maybe want to say, yes, I'm Irish as a point of pride, but don't necessarily actually use it in their daily lives. Again, these are estimates because there aren't official figures on this, but what I've gotten from people in Ireland that I know is that around 94,000 people are habitual, what they call habitual daily users of Irish outside the school system in their daily lives. And of those, <coughs> some 40,000 to 80,000 are actually native speakers. So the number of Irish speakers who are actually native speakers of the language is a 20th or less of the total number. So it's a very interesting position there. Because of all kinds of questions. Who is the arbiter of good usage? The native speakers or the majority? Which again, I won't get into here. There's all sorts of interesting social linguistic issues that come up when you look at Irish. Scottish Gaelic, again according to the 2011 census, around 87,000 total speakers, of whom some 58,000 are native speakers, out of a total population of over 5 million, so a small percentage, plus around 12 to 1,300 people in Nova Scotia, primarily in Cape Breton, due to an emigrant community. And finally, Probably my favorite language in the whole world. <laughs> my darling, Manx. Oh. Um, like which is <laughs> spoken by, according to the 2011 census, 1,823 oh. people. Yeah. Out of a total population on the island of around 75 or 76,000. Wow. Of whom, again, one to 200 can be regarded as native speakers in that they were children brought up with both English and Manx Gaelic, bilingually. So, all the languages are under severe threat, pressure. They're all classified as endangered. Um, talk a little bit, so I can cover this in sort of five minutes or so. Um, the Gaelic languages, just to give you a bit of more further information about them, uh, the current status. You'll find name usage varies a bit. <coughs> Gaelic versus Irish and so on. First off, in Scottish English, the word is pronounced Gaelic. So most people from Scotland will say Gaelic rather than Gaelic. Everywhere else in the English-speaking world, including Cape Breton, where they speak Scottish Gaelic, they call it Gaelic. <laughs> you will occasionally find people who say, no, no, Gaelic's a language of Ireland, Gaelic's a language of Scotland. <laughs> They're the same thing, just regional variants and pronunciation. Um, Another thing is that in Ireland, 